Shalom, shalom, uh, class on the Shifting Romance with Israel. So glad you're in the course and uh, appreciate the posts that you're putting up and the enthusiasm with which you're approaching the whole subject matter. I want to address a couple of questions that have been put forward to me this week and uh, make this my video presentation for week four. Uh, first uh, question comes from Duressa from Ethiopia. He writes, the Bible is so clear on that those who bless Israel will be blessed and those who curse will be cursed. We realize the early America and early American Christians blessed or joyfully welcomed the Jewish immigrants and God blessed America and American Christians as a response and they enjoyed the blessings. Later on we realize that many European countries developed anti-Semitic sentiment towards the, uh, the Jewish people in America and American Christians shared that evil ideology. What was God's response for anti-Semitism based on the covenant he made with Abraham, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you, over European countries, American and American Christians uh, who involve themselves in anti-Semitism? Dear Dr. Gana, would you address that question from the biblical point of view? Thanks. Well, well, first of all, thank you for your questions, Duressa. This is the most important topic and one which has great meaning and significance to all peoples and nations, including Ethiopia, and to all ethnic and language groups like the Gafat believing community that you represent in Ethiopia. This is especially meaningful as we are currently witnessing the great rise of anti-Semitism not only in Europe, but in America, and most distressingly, even among those professing faith in Yeshua in America. First, we, we need to recognize that God launched a plan for the redemption of mankind in, et in eternity past, as Yeshua was the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. God intended that the chief agent of redemption, the Messiah Yeshua, would function as the king, priest, and prophet of Israel, the promised seed of Abraham. Through Abraham, God would raise up a national missions agency, the Jewish people, designed to effect a ministry of reconciliation of all peoples of the earth to the creator of all. And Yeshua would function as the king of Israel and successfully lead Israel into the accomplishment of her divine mission. Yeshua, at the helm of Israel, would affect the happy conclusion of salvation history, that is, the universe reconciled to the holiness of God. Now, Genesis 12 makes clear that God uh, would be blessing all parties who side with him and his interests. And since he is choosing to bless and promising to use Israel for his own divine objective, all others who come alongside God in this blessing of Israel, who contribute to the success of the divinely issued mission of Israel, will themselves enjoy the great and meaningful blessings of God. All those who defy God and resist his choosing of Israel, or who do all that they can to prevent Israel from enjoying God's blessings, who actively seek to prevent the successful accomplishment of the divine objective for Israel to function as the leading divine agency to reconcile all, ma all nations to God under the authority of Yeshua and the enabling power of the Holy Spirit, those Yes, they will be cursed of God. From the earliest days of supersessionism or replacement theology in the middle years of the second century, the church gradually shifted further and further away from identification with the physical progeny of the patriarchs and presumed the church to be the replacement people a new Israel, a new chosen people 
to fulfill the same divine mission. Whereas apostolic teaching clearly envisions Gentile branches being grafted onto Israel's olive tree and taking its nourishment from the same patriarchal nutrients, leading Christian thinkers moved away from the biblical position to one that dismissed Israel as having any further relevance to God, that Israel has been fully disinherited, that God had despaired of the Jews and fully opted for a different entity, the Gentile church. This non-biblical teaching was gradually embraced over the next centuries and is still today the prominent theology of the church in almost all nations. It has been challenged more in English-speaking nations over recent centuries, but we find replacement theology and its offspring, anti-Semitism, finding new levels of support in the Anglo or English-speaking nations in century 21. The British Puritans, relocating to the colonies of New England, brought with them a theology that called for a revitalized Jewish people and national Israel. 17th century American theology linked the American future with Israel's destiny and the outplaying of salvation history coming with the fraternal restorations of both Israel and the church to their first century points of departure. This favor toward the Jewish people and a Zionist restoration colored American thinking for centuries and culminated in the American embrace of national Israel in clear and abiding terms in the 20th century. The anti-Semitism of Europe of the, of the late 19th century and into the 1920s and 1930s profoundly impacted American opinion as so many Americans looked to Europe for, for intellectual and social leadership in spite of the general lack of appetite for international politics or related movements that characterize the American people. But the active antipathies toward the Jewish people in both Europe and America contributed to the massive loss of life in Western Christendom as 60 million people died in World War II. It seems to me that a Christianity embracing a sounder biblical theology of Israel would have had a more profound effect upon Western nations. And if you step away from the biblical revelation, preferring your own systematic theological ideas and want to impose them upon society, uh, you're destined to misstep. You're destined to miscalculate and to craft a mindset and a worldview which is highly dangerous. And the fabrication of Christian ideas that were not based upon the simple revelation of Scripture created a religious milieu in Europe and in the United States that lent itself very favorably to anti-Semitism and the rise of the Holocaust. A biblically compromised church, therefore, would be vulnerable to anti-Semitic propaganda. And a church laced with anti-Semitism would not be able to properly treat uh, Jewish people, nor prevent its, their own governments or societies from experiencing wholesale destruction. The current trend in European Christendom, where 70% are reportedly anti-Semitic, and in the USA, where everything from government agencies to university faculties to business enterprises are growing in hostility towards the Jewish people internationally, as well as toward the state of Israel, will result in calamity, catastrophe, plague, and destruction. And all men and nations beware, God will curse all those who curse his people Israel. 
We need to be agents of God, working alongside God and the blessing of Israel and the Jewish people, particularly with the gospel. And we need to pray that soon Israel will embrace her divine mission under the authority of Yeshua and as empowered by the Spirit and accomplish her ministry of reconciliation. So thank you, Teresa, for your question, or series of questions. Now let me move to a second set of questions uh, put forward by Emilio. Um, so Emilio is looking now for some simple definitions of uh, theological terms which we tend to use uh, on an ongoing basis in our course, so let me try to do that, particularly in light of uh, his special interest. Uh, supersessionism, supersessionism is the extra-biblical, that is to say, outside the Bible. You know, much of Christian thought comes from outside the Bible and is simply inherited and passed on generation after generation. And supersessionism, or replacement theology, is a concept that, that does not have any solid footing in Scripture itself. It is taken bits and pieces and things are thrown together in such a way as to fabricate a new theology uh, that basically suggests that the church has completely replaced Israel in God's program of salvation history. Supersessionism contends that God has no further need of Israel since, it, since Yeshua himself is the embodiment of all that God needed in Israel and the Jewish people. I mean, if you have, if you have Jesus, why do you need the Jews? And so the rejection of Yeshua on the part of supersessionists in the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th centuries and going forward uh, com compelled then the, re uh, the, 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 the rejection of, of Yeshua uh, convinced theologians in these centuries that God was compelled to abandon his commitments to somehow defeatedly go back on his word, his promises, his commitments to the patriarchs and their progeny, and to somehow, um, as a next course of action, come up with a plan B. Uh, God was simply a bit befuddled by this turn of events and now needed to come up with a plan B, an alternate strategy. And we call this, a, this alternate strategy then uh, the Gentile church. And since Israel was a total has-been and God's program had now uh, radically changed to exclude Israel, there was no need for Yeshua to come and reign from Zion since there would never need to be a restored Jewish nation. No millennial reign of Yeshua is termed ah millennialism, the rejection of the idea that Yeshua will come and rule and reign upon the earth, that there will be no millennium or 1,000 year reign upon the earth is called ah or no millennialism. And any references to Israel in the book of Revelation or the epistles from an amillennialist point of view is simply a symbolic reference to the church. Now with regard to Israel's roles, roles in the eschaton, there is no difference, Emilio, between dispensationalism and dispensational premillennialism. In this nearly 200-year-old theological scheme, the church is, is raptured at the conclusion of the church age. And then, with the church gone, the Jews undergo yet another holocaust. And according to this uh, dispensational premillennialism, then many in Israel come to faith in Jesus in the absence of the church. In other words, it's almost as like the church has got to be removed before the Jews can really have a fair opportunity to really become uh, believers in Jesus. And the, the reestablishment 
of the Jewish state in 1948 is welcomed by the dispensationalists as a prelude or as an introduction to the end times. So there's a lot of enthusiasm for the Jewish state, uh, the 1948 resurrection of a, of, of a, a home for Jewish people, uh, because it all it, it all is a um, uh, precursor to the second coming, to the coming of Jesus. And so Yeshua himself returns in dispensational premillennialism after the seven-year Holocaust to administer judgment upon anti-Semites, anti-Zionists, which is the modern term for anti-Semitism, and enable Israel to discharge their national mission. In other words, Yeshua comes back to bring judgment upon all the anti-Semites and those resisting Israel and to enable Israel now to fulfill her destiny of preaching the good news to all peoples and nations everywhere. Now, when it comes down to it, dispensationalism is an abbreviated form of replacement theology. Um, as it limits Israel's exclusion or do-nothing condition or out-of-God's-program condition for perhaps 2,000 years and not permanently. In other words, whereas amillennialism is ready to dismiss the Jews or supersessionism is, is prepared to just discount any Jewish significance going forward altogether for all eternity, the dispensationalists say, that's not true for all of eternity because God has promises to Israel, to the patriarchs, which he needs to fulfill, and that will have to happen, but, say they, that will not take place until the utopian future. So, in dispensationalism, um, there is a sense in which dispensationalism is not replacement theology because it holds to an eventual program of God working with Israel again, but on the other hand, it is replacement theology because it says, well, there is no dealing of God with the house of Israel for the space of these 2,000 years, or if it turns out to be 2,500 years or 3,000 years, however it turns out to be, God doesn't deal with the Jews until the last days or the end of time. And uh, because now uh, the, the, the Jewish people as, as Israel uh, have no particular relevance to God or his program for the ages until the end of the church age. In other words, now is the, the age of the church, the Gentile church. Now is not the time for the Jews to get saved, as some of these uh, pro-Israel groups have dared to say. Now is not time for the Jews to be saved. Now is the time for us to just uh, show them comfort and not discomfort them with the gospel. And um, because they, the dispensationalists want to embrace the idea that, that um, the church is the current and the only current program God is presently administering, that, the, that Israel will not have another opportunity until Jesus comes back. In historical premillennialism, now this is different than dispensational, or dispensational premillennialism. In historical premillennialism, the church has replaced Israel as the realm of divine activity and divine hope. So in this sense, there is a replacement. The church has substituted in God's program for Israel. And Christians, in fact, then are the spiritual Israel. Nevertheless, in this scheme of thinking, uh, Yeshua will return to Zion, and he will rule the world at the conclusion of a great tribulation. And the New Testament references to Israel and to the 12 tribes in Revelation uh, apply to the church. These are symbolic references for the church and do not apply to the Jewish people. So, they, the, the historical premillennialists would expect a return of Jesus and the launching of a thousand year reign upon the earth, but it's not as though the Jewish people play any particular role in this. Um, accordingly then, historical premillennialism 
would see no urgency to evangelize the Jewish people uh, because the Jews were not in any way related or connected with the divine plan. I mean, if Jews want, you know, if Jews want to believe in Jesus and become part of the church, swell. But I mean, really, their their ethnicity or their their people group or God's promises to biblical Israel, all that are, is irrelevant to the overall thrust of things. Now, dispensational premillennialism would call for evangelism of the Jewish people and their immediate incorporation into the church. In other words, uh, those that are of a Baptistic orientation or uh, uh, you know, a traditional Pentecostal uh, mid-20th century mindset, uh, they would want to evangelize the Jewish people to bring them into the church, make them part of the church. But since in this scheme of things, the salvation of, of Israel is completely distinct from church involvement. In other words, when we see biblical Israel coming to faith, it's without the aid of the church. And since uh, the salvation of Israel is distinct from Christian involvement, and, and the rapture of the church to heaven precedes Israel's national salvation by some seven years, there's a big disconnect here. And there is little expectation of faith then for the salvation of large numbers of Jewish people during the present church age. In other words, there may be Jews who are saved, but they'll just be few and far between because the big things are only going to happen in the future. So this kind of worldview fosters a great lack of faith, a lack of expectation that God is going to be doing anything significant, significant among Jewish people for the foreseeable future. And so there is a serious lack of of faith in evangelical dispensationalism with regard to the salvation of Jewish people, which means there's a lack of Jewish fruit. We don't really apply, we don't make the efforts that we should in trying to reach out to the Jewish people. Well, I just want to encourage you, uh, continue in your readings, continue in your good posts, continue with your interaction with one another. Remember, you are expected to respond to two reading assignments, to two other kinds of writing assignments, and then, of course, the, the, the weekly uh, concluding piece. And uh, you are responsible to, to not only put up two posts in each of those, you know, which means ten posts, but then you are to be responding to other student posts as well. So there is a, there is a fair amount of involvement but as you are doing this, there is a great amount of learning. You can learn not only from the textbooks and from the lectures that we print or from occasional videos, but you can be learning extensively from one another. And this is what makes these online courses so very rich. So I want to encourage you to not slight yourself by not fully engaging in your proper amount of, of a reading, your proper amount of writing, because that is where so much of your learning will take place. Well, God bless you. Have a wonderful week four. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next time right back here on our uh, romance, uh, Shifting Romance with Israel course. God bless you.